when I was in university, I was given as a gift a book entitled The Splendor of the Psalms, Photographic Meditation. The book contains passages from the Psalms accompanied by photos, landscapes, someone fishing, children playing, lights of a city at night. Now, by that time in my life, I had read all the Psalms, and I'd heard many of them during Monday or Sunday morning worship services. And like most of us, I was very familiar with at least Psalm 23. But as I read this book, the words that stopped me, the words I went back to whenever I picked the book up again, were the words of Psalm 8. When you have the book open, Psalm 8, the left-hand page is a photograph of a flock of geese launching into flight against a background of clouds, the edges of the clouds tinged with the reddish-orange glow of the setting sun. The right-hand page, the words, at least some of the words of Psalm 8, Translation from the Revised Standard Version of the Bible. I'd like to read those words again as they are printed in that book with a few changes to make the language more inclusive of all humanity. When I look at the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast established, what are human beings that thou art mindful of us, that thou dost care for us, that thou hast made us little less than God, and dost crown us with glory and honor. Thou hast given us dominion over the works of your hands. Thou hast put all things under our feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is thy name in all the earth always found the use of the words thy and thou at a kind of Shakespearean flair to the whole thing. Something in Psalm 8 resonated with me then and resonates with me now. I think many of us can feel some experiential connection with the psalmist's sense of awe in looking at the heavens, the stars, the moon. We can remember times when we were children, perhaps, looking up in the night sky at that shimmering, beautiful, mysterious object called the moon. We still particularly notice the moon at times when it's a full moon or an autumn moon. Or we can relate to the psalmist's words when we sit on a lake shore, we see a prairie sunset, or listen to the sound of rain gently falling on the ground outside our windows. And somehow we feel that we are part of all of this, that this world, this creation is beautiful and awesome and amazing. And we want to just sit and observe and appreciate. As a psalmist experiences this incredible creation of God, the psalmist begins to think about this creation and begins to think about his own place, her own, her own place in this creation. I do that sometimes. Sometimes when I'm walking, I'm aware of this world of trees, grass, lake water, geese, clouds, sky. But sometimes I pause and I let my imagination expand that awareness. To imagine that I'm seeing myself through a camera lens up above and the camera begins to move outwards into space. I become smaller and smaller and then I'm gone. And the whole earth comes into view and then the earth becomes a speck in this Milky Way galaxy. And the camera moves further and further to take in other galaxies and then reaches a place at the edge of the universe. And everything is just tiny specks in a vastness. Those moments, imaginatively, what I can see so vast, I can't see myself. I'm just a crumb. I'm not even a visible particle. I'm not seemingly of any significance in all of this. And then sometimes I realize that my significance is that I am part of all of this. All of this that is God's creation. All of this that somehow exists in God, all of this in which God somehow exists. The psalmist asks, what are we human beings that you, God, would pay us any mind? She would even notice us. We seem so small in all of this. The psalmist doesn't directly answer that question. Instead, the psalmist observes that humans seem to have not only a unique 
but seemingly a superior place in this creation, saying that God has created humans as only slightly lower than God, than the angels, than any divine heavenly dwelling, that God has given humans glory and honor, and we are the ones who get to stand on the podium. If every plant and bird and animal had the equivalent to a national anthem, on the final day of the story of creation, it's the anthem of the human race that would be playing, because humans seem to take top spot in God's creation. It is humans to whom God has given dominion over everything else, all creatures, all resources. I read Psalm 8 then, and I felt uplifted, inspired. It was an affirmation that God loves, cares about all of us humans. I read Psalm 8 now and still, still feel that it affirms God's love, but that it affirms God's love, not just for humans, but for all creation. I now want to change the imagery the psalmist uses that God has given humans dominion over all things, that God has put all things under our feet. The image of someone having their foot on you is not a nice image. It's one of oppression and superiority. But what is under our feet is also what holds us up. It's what supports us. It's what grounds us. So perhaps we can also read these words as a reminder that humans rely on creation. Without the sun, moon, stars, fish, birds, animals, soils, rocks, ground, we are not grounded. We don't know where we come from or who we are. We have no place to stand. We wouldn't exist. We do not own creation. We are part of creation. We live in relationship with creation. And if all creation is God's creation, then we should not presume that God loves only humans. God loves all creatures, all creation. And maybe what is most unique about humans is that being created in the image of God somehow means we have the capacity to love creation as God loves creation. Think of it this way. What if all the creatures on earth, humans, fish, birds, elephants, whales, lions, tigers, and bears, We're asked by God for a suggestion on improving God's creation. It scares me to think it's possible that all the other creatures might say, you know, God, the biggest problem with this world is those human beings who keep polluting, filling the oceans with garbage, using up the resources, decimating forests, destroying the habitats needed for the rest of us to survive. All the other creatures, Psalm, might say to God, why did you create human beings? Why do you give any mind to them? The Bible was written by human beings, so of course it focuses on God's relationship with humans. But in the Bible, we also find an awareness of God present throughout creation. Biblical prophetic visions of new creation speak of all creation, of sun and moon and mountains and hills and fruit trees and all wild animals, everything that flies, praising God. Jesus tells his disciples, look at the lilies that are clothed by God. Jesus says the rest of creation can teach humans how to participate in God's creation. I think today's gospel reading can also do that. It speaks of our need for a change in attitude and perspective and how we relate to the rest of God's creation. In the story, parents bring children to Jesus, wanting Jesus to touch them, bless them. But the disciples speak sternly to the parents, want them to leave Jesus alone. Maybe the disciples thought Jesus was too busy to spend time with children. Maybe they thought he was tired. Maybe they thought he needed to spend his time doing important things, healing people who were really in bad shape, making an impact in the world. But just Jesus disagrees and he says something that I think is very Jesus-like. He responds in a way that's annoying to those who like a direct and specific answer because his response is open, it seems to me, to multiple interpretations. He says that if we want to receive the kingdom of God, we must receive it as a child. If we want to experience what it is to participate in God's creation, then we have to be in this creation as child. So interpreters have offered many takes on what it means to be like a child in our faith, to be curious, to be full of wonder, to not need to dominate, to usually as a child be the most vulnerable, not the most powerful. Perhaps receiving as a child means not receiving in order to control, but receiving in order to appreciate and to have within us awakened a sense of thankfulness. But I think there's another way to hear what Jesus says. Not that we are like children receiving the kingdom of God. 
Perhaps we are like adults who discover that the God we receive comes to us like a child. That God doesn't arrive as seemingly the most powerful, the most successful, the most dominant. Perhaps God even appears in our midst as one crucified. So I continue to be heartened and haunted by Psalm 8. The psalmist continues to invite me into a place of reverent awe as I am aware of the wonder of God's creation. And the psalmist continues to invite me to wonder about the place of human beings in God's creation. And invites me to accept that God created us in some way for God's sake, that we and all creation are somehow an expression and an embodiment of God's creative spirit, of God's shaping and creating spirit, of God's love. Invites me to be open and responsive to God loving creation through our humanity. Open and responsive to be an expression of God's spirit and flesh in this world. Open and responsive to being to receiving God as one receives a child. To be open and responsive to being a child of God in this world. To be open and responsive to loving creation as God loves creation. Be open and responsive to God's spirit present in all people and all creation. To be open and responsive to being a companion of the resurrected Christ and to being God's people. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>